Okay, so moving on to the second half. Um, I want to introduce a new concept which is emerging out of the analysis so far, which is that of exceptionalism. Um, the arguments that are made in favour of Brexit and in favour of other kind of um, right-wing nationalist movements are an, an idea of exceptionalism. And I'm going to say psychologically this comes from what's called ego inflation. It's the idea that me and mine is best. Mine is better than yours. And it's looking at things from an ego perspective. Rather than seeing that the we, or the collective, or the corporation, is the path to enlightenment, it, it, it fixates on this ego. And I think um, Brexit appealed to um, exceptionalism. This idea in Britain that we're the top nation. We're better than the Europeans. After all, we defeated them in wars. We're better than the Germans. We're better than the French, better than the Italian, you know, that sort of arrogance of British exceptionalism, which is very deep, it goes back a long way. And I think it's founded on hot air, having lived in Europe, having travelled about being a British Canadian universalist world seeker. I think it is really like a, like a form of mental illness, this arrogance. And I see it in the top Tories discussing Brexit and promoting it. It, it really, it needs, it needs exorcising. And, and it is fake. And it's that arrogance which led to the mass killing in India in Amritsar, which shocked Gandhi when this general said, open fire on the Sikhs of the Amritsar massacre, which lost Britain and India. It was that arrogance um, which the Indians suddenly thought, who are these people? Who, who do they think they've got the right to do this? It was that attitude in Ireland which lost support in Ireland. The, the, the arrogance over the Irish family, oh, well, you know, let them. It's just a side effect of capitalism. We can't help them, you know, let them die kind of attitude. It's shocking and it lacks any ethics. Oh, Brexit might have a down, down effect. Yes, there'll be a few million unemployed homeless and the, some banks will go, there'll be collapse of industry, but boy, it's worth it in the long run because it upholds that British exceptionist narrative, which is fake and a lie. So we're being led into the same people that led us into the trenches of mass slaughter. It was the same arrogance. Um, that, that was behind World War I. And it's not Britain only has this, it's every country has it potentially, but Britain seems to be leading the charge on this, which I find shocking. Um, <clears throat> because if you look at the depth of British history, at its best, all that's best about the culture comes actually from and in symbiosis with European culture at its best. My mother was a French teacher and so brought me up to speak French and appreciate French culture and literature. Um, without European philosophy and literature, Britain's intellectual climate would be much poorer. Um, and I have friends that, uh, Druids, that say, well, no, everything the Romans did was wrong, we don't like the Romans, we're great British Druids. Um, there's two flaws with that argument, which is that firstly, not everything the Romans gave to European culture and civilization was bad. They brought the alphabet, they brought education, they brought poetry, they brought roads, they brought amazing architectural achievements. They brought art. They, they were the source for a lot of Greek philosophy coming into Western Europe. Um, and they brought um, you know, immense, immense learning. And there were some very great Roman thinkers like Numa Pompilius, um, who founded the Roman calendar and Roman religion. And their pagan ideas were very advanced with Cicero and people in his book on the nature of the gods. Um, and the second falsity in the argument is that Druidry itself is pan-European. I've spent a lot of time researching the Druid sites of France and Gaul. This was a heartland of the Celts. And um, the pagan traditions of, of the Celts were throughout Europe, um, in France, in Austria, in the Danube region, in, in um, Switzerland, and in many of the European capitals we have now, like Paris, Bordeaux, Clermont-Ferrand, um, and Brussels and Strasbourg were Druid cities founded by Celts. Even Milan in northern Italy was a Celtic area. Before the Romans even appeared, the Celts were there. Because the Celts invented the wagon and the cart and the wheel, apparently, back in the Iron Age, they thought of putting an iron rim on the tire of wood and opened long-distance transport routes across Europe. That was a Celtic achievement. And so you were feeling at home, if you were in Ireland, you might, you know, pop down to the Danube for, for some travels. If you were a Druid, it was a 
It was a pan-European thing. You were welcome and honoured in every tribe. So the classical era is important. We imported uh, with, with uh, the Romanization of the British Isles, um, not just the Latin alphabet, but the study of philosophy and mathematics and so on. So British exceptionalism breaks down, if you actually look at it, because um, what I'm arguing is that every European nation is exceptionally gifted and talented. You know, in Italy, there is a whole nation of geniuses who produced Leonardo da Vinci and invented the violin and the piano and gave us Stradivarius and gave us um, the cultural achievements of Italian thought, Dante and Petrarch and so on. Um, you know, each and then Germany with its own uh, roster of geniuses up to Goethe and Kant and all the great intellectuals. So every nation is, is exceptional in my understanding. Every nation is, is a hotbed of geniuses. We need to find a formula whereby we can celebrate and, and merge them all. Ireland, every, every Irishman is, is kind of a genius um, as well because of that native wit and intellectual uh, achievement. And in the Druid tradition, it was oral. It wasn't, it wasn't a written thing. Okay, so let's, let's um, go on here. I want to address a couple of issues now in the UK structure. Bre the Brexit rhetoric, um, which I'm giving a D- as an examiner, philosophy coming into these parliamentarians, they've got a D mark. No, actually it's an F, it's a fail. Mm -hmm. It never took account of the Scottish narrative of history. Brexit is an English nationalist rhetoric, invented by English uh, Tory MPs, supported by a few outmoded uh, you know, Labour MPs who thought. Corbyn seems to be hearing voices, as far as I can tell. Some of them are tempting him with the Brexit demons. Um, None of them have listened to or, or imbibed the wisdom of the Scottish uh, narrative. You see, having lived in Scotland for seven years and studying Scottish history and using the University of Glasgow and going to meetings and sitting at the feet of Scottish intellectuals, who are mainly Scottish nationalist intellectuals, I saw the world totally differently through their eyes. They, they have a very proud and long history in which the English don't figure as particularly heroic geniuses. During this Hundred Years' War, even, the Scots were uh, identifying with the French cause and were seeing the English as barbarians. After I moved to France and went to Limoges, I discovered that uh, the Black Prince, the great hero of English schoolboys, was a, a warmonger and um, committed uh, war crimes. He massacred the population of Limoges. Um, and the French have not forgotten this. Um, a lot of Scots went over and helped, and then when Joan of Arc finally led the resistance against the English barbarians, you know, the Scots were supporting them. The tradition is, of course, that the Scots also inherited from Europe the Knights Templars who came and helped with their wars of liberation at the time of Wallace and uh, Bruce, and they finally got independence, which was hard won from the English brutes, as they saw it, and the brutality of the occupation of Scotland. They fought them off. They got their independence and um, during the time of the Renaissance, the Scottish monarchy presided over a court of very high intellectual achievement. Um, there, were, there were great mathematicians, geometers, architects, savants. There was a Renaissance in Scotland that most English people don't even know it existed. And when the Stuart the crown took over the whole of the UK, the person James VI, you see, the Scottish monarchs were marrying into European monarchies, Italian and French. Mary, Queen of Scots, um, was a product of that. And um, she symbolised that, that Renaissance culture, if you want. And so when her son, James VI, became king of Great Britain, and for the first time the crowns of Scotland and England and Wales united, that was a very important thing. It had a cultural resonance which gave birth to the Jacobite Renaissance. There's a book by Martha Souchard called Restoring the Temple of Vision about the Scottish Kabbalistic origins of Freemasonry and how it lived on in the Jacobite exiles. Um, and, and it was at a higher level in some ways than the English um, uh, had, had attempted. Although under Elizabeth and with John Dee and Francis Bacon, they were also of high caliber. That's why they supported this project of Great Britain. That's why they supported James. And so 
what we're faced with in Brexit is, is the confirmation that the independence movement in Scotland was right, that there's no way to get independence within the United Kingdom. They have to have a final separation. And so um, my 100% certainty is that if Brexit is pushed down the throats of Scotland by these triumphalist English MPs, Scotland will go for independence sooner or later and almost certainly will then rejoin the European Union, which will mean that England is left alone high and dry as an independent little nation. I think Wales will also turn its um, Celtic blood and realise, as Plain Cymru was saying, that its homeland is, is also in Europe. Um, so this, this English exception fails to recognise the brutality the English did against Scotland, the Highland clearances, which Marx writes about in, in his studies. He was very conscious his wife um, was of Scottish descent, and uh, he felt very strongly the rights of the Scottish people had been trampled on. And the um, you know, suppression of Scottish identity, I think, will we'll come back. Um, now, what these Tories are doing is simply ignorant. There's no other excuse or explanation or apologies. It's simply ignorant. You see, if somebody ignores something consistently and long enough, then that, their behaviour is what we call ignorant. And that's what these Brexiteers in the Tory ranks are doing. They're ignoring Scottish history and culture and independence. And the fact that Scotland voted for Remain in, in the 2016 referendum is glossed over by them in the narrative. But I think actually it's, it's enough that you say, well, OK, then it, we can't impose Brexit on the Scottish people because they will, they will reject it and they will vote for independence. If you care about the United Kingdom, as I do, coming from that metaphysics of love and you want to keep it together, you have to reject Brexit. That's, that's an argument that I think stands alone in its own right as to invalidate the thing. And I admire the Scottish Nationalist MPs in Parliament who are saying this consistently again and again. Right now they're saying a second referendum should be on the table. It's the only way to solve this. I think that politically is, is the only way to go. <clears throat> I also want to come to the question of Irish acceptance which again is ignored by the Brexiteers. The English nationalist Brexiteers think they can push Brexit onto the island of Ireland and everything will go on as it is. It's just the UK will be out of the European Union. I remember the time of troubles which lasted from 1967 to 1990 and I remember the bombs going off on the mainland and I'm quarter Irish myself and I've taken the time and the effort to study Irish history and I've learned about it, I've travelled there. And I set up the British and Irish Truth and Reconciliation Commission and had meetings. I've met people on both sides, all sides of the, the conflicts. And I watched with pride and pleasure after I did some Druid peace work um, at um, Tara, we did some ceremonies of peace. Two weeks later, the IRA finally declared their final ceasefire and, and accepted the Good Friday Agreement, and the Protestants did the same. And it's been peace since, thank God. Right. I, I do not want to see a recurrence of these, this time of troubles, but I can foresee it if Brexit goes ahead for the following reason. <clears throat> the, the, the discourse in the media only emphasises the hard border problem, but that masks a much deeper and bigger problem, <coughs> which is the fact that the people of Northern Ireland voted in favour of remaining in the European Union. It's the same as the Scottish problem. Their will is expressed democratically was to remain in the European Union. Hang on, just going to a quick drink here. <coughs> so if you force Brexit on the people of Northern Ireland, you're going against their wishes. And that's not a very wise and true move. <coughs> the only people, and I would say that you're going against the wishes to such an extent that it's, it's endangering the health and welfare of the whole of the island. <coughs> um, <clears throat> so,
So, <clears throat> um, if Brexit is pushed forward, and let's say that the Tories flirt with this idea of a hard Brexit, and <clears throat> they simply go out without any agreement and, and dare anyone to do anything about it, um, the DUP have said they will support that. The Protestant Ulster loyalists who want to stay in the UK and want to be part of it, that's their bottom line. Say, that's fine, we'll all leave together, we're happy. Um, <clears throat> there is this thing under the Good Friday Agreement which kicks in at that point, whereby if any significant constitutional changes happen to Northern Ireland, it's supposed to be put to a referendum. And the people of Northern Ireland as a whole can then vote on whether they want to reunify with the South and become one island. And if that is approved, I mean, that's, some of the Tories have said yes, we'll, we'll honour that agreement, we'll give them that right. So let's say hard Brexit happens, second referendum in Northern Ireland happens, and the people of Northern Ireland demographically will vote to rejoin the Republic. My fear is that at that point, the DUP supporters, the hardline Protestants, the Unionists, won't let that happen, even if the referendum goes against them, and they'll start fighting again. The, the risk is that fights will start again on the streets of Ireland. I can't see the descendants of Ian Paisley accepting to be reunited with the European Union, Southern Ireland Republic, you know. And I suspect that the fighting will start again on the streets of Ireland in Belfast and other areas. The, there's a, there's a, you know, you can do an ethical accountancy. The odds are at least, I'd say, 70 or 80 or 90 percent in favor of violence breaking out again. And what kind of violence? Well, I've just read about the Miami show band Massacre. One of the survivors have written a book about how a pop group in the 70s was, was attacked by a hardline uh, unionist cell operating within the British Army uh, in, with, con with collusion from British intelligence, they arrested and stopped this pop group because they had both Catholic and Protestant singers in it. Um, and they stopped them at a fake checkpoint and tried to kill them all. They were going to blow them all up. One of them escaped to tell the story. He's just written a book, Stephen Travers, and you can watch him being interviewed. Uh, that sort of, and they were just singers, and the lead singer was shot, you know, in the face to disfigure him and all that, by these hardline thugs who thought they were doing this in the name of the UK. This is what really annoys me as a British citizen, as a UK citizen. These people were killing pop singers in the name of my country. Now those people and their descendants, I think, will go back and do some of the things to prevent the reunification of Ireland. So, so as a you know the arch druid of the peace druids of Britain, I'm I'm saying, hey guys, look down the pass. You know, look from this view. You can see that trouble ahead. Don't go down that pass. Right. So, um, <clears throat> the Irish are, uh, are too you know it's too precious that peace and too hard won. This is why Tony Blair, for all his follies in the Middle East, has realised he's flying the flag to stop Brexit as much as I am, um, and it's his Irish wife who's helping him in that. We have to stop Brexit for that reason. I mentioned earlier um, the struggles of Irish nationalism. People don't realise how deep they go back in terms of esoteric history. There was a flourishing Theosophical Society in, in Dublin, um, and the Irish Druid tradition is unbroken. When I went to see the Fellowship of Isis um, uh, founders, Reverend Derwin Robertson, Clonagall Castle back in the early 80s, and I met Irish pagans and so on. There's, there's been a continual tradition of Irish Druid history. Um, Derwin Robertson told me to read um, Geoffrey Keating, the historian of Irish history, Geoffrey O. Keating, who wrote the sacred history of Druid times, right from the creation to modern times. He lived in the 1600s. And he went around all the monasteries and abbeys of Ireland with precious medieval manuscripts finding the history of the coming of the different peoples to Ireland. Um, he was writing in Gaelic and Latin. And he was eventually killed by a Protestant invader, um, probably at the time of the Cromwell invasions, who just slaughtered these people. And they burned a lot of the libraries. What is 
The cultural um, ravages that were done in Ireland are what annoy me as well. Um, they not only kill the priests, they also burn and stole the libraries and things. And this was done in the name of Protestantism and progress and science. So William Petty, who was in Cromwell's army, was one of the founders of the Royal Society later. And you know, they were clever because they did maths and they didn't care about the soul. In fact, you weren't even allowed to discuss the soul in the Royal Society. But I'm with Thomas Hobbes, who refused to join the Royal Society because, because they wouldn't discuss the important things like, like I'm trying to talk about political ethics. He was banned from the Royal Society because they just wanted to measure weights and calculate gravities and things. Hobbes said, no, it's social gravity, it's peace that we should be concerned with. And I'm, I'm with Hobbes, who also had to flee into exile in France, along with many other intellectuals, from these Cromwellian extremists. He was the mathematics tutor of Charles II. So fast forward, you know, the Irish cultural renaissance of the 19th century, which gave rise to the 1916 revolution. Um, Yeats, and, and I mentioned Maud Gone. She was Yeats's muse, and she fell in love with and married John McBride, who was uh, in the Irish Republican Army. These were very amazing people who were deeply spiritual. Their son, uh, Sean McBride went on to become one of the most important diplomats in Irish history. He helped set up the United Nations. He, he was an ambassador for peace from Ireland. And there's now the International Peace Bureau has the Sean McBride Prize, which um, has just been awarded to some poets in Cyprus. And they give it every year to people doing peace work around the world. I'm friends with the International Peace Bureau. And my group, Philosophers for Peace, you know, is a member of that. And so Sean, Sean McBride is one of the great jewels of Irish cultural gift to the world, which is about peace. So to, to destroy all that with Brexit is, is about as intelligent as going into Harrods with a chainsaw and just smashing everything. We should celebrate this culture of, of Ireland, both North and South, because, um, you know, it's not the Irish independence struggle was also, Wolf Town was a Protestant. It was not just a Catholic thing. It was, uh, to me, true independence is a struggle for.